As the cost of living continues to grow higher and higher, many black Americans are leaving expensive Democratic-led cities they once fled to and going back to the South in search of better economic opportunities. Half a century ago, approximately six million black people left the South to get away from Jim Crow laws, among other things, in what became known as the Great Migration. Fast forward 50 years, and the tides are reversing. Writer and host of the Fresh Perspective podcast, Jeff Charles, wrote about this phenomenon for us at Newsweek, and he's here to give us insight into what's behind this shift. Welcome, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's so great to have you. So tell us a little bit about your piece. Um, you describe this as a reverse reverse great migration. Walk us through the argument. Yeah, Batia, that what we're seeing here is nothing short of historic. Um, shortly after Reconstruction, black Americans moved in droves to the north. Um, at that time, about 90% of black Americans resided in the south. By 1970, that percentage dropped to 52%. And it's been it had been stagnant for quite a while. But now we're seeing a reversal of this trend. Black Americans are now, now moving more towards the south in droves. And, and the numbers are astounding. Hmm. And what do you think are going to be the ramifications of all of that? You know, I think I think honestly, it's going to make for better opportunity for Black Americans. I mean, we this is part of an, a, an exodus that we're seeing from blue states in general. People are moving from the north and from the west to red states in the south because they're seeking better opportunities, better, more more affordable housing, education. There, there's a lot that's involved here. I mean, and I'm actually one of them. I was born and raised in Southern California, and I moved to Texas in 2012, and now I'm in here in Florida. So th th this is going to be an ongoing trend with blue states losing residents, especially black Americans, and the red states picking them up. So in the piece, you, you speak so eloquently to a big question, which is, you know, it, is it the case? So, so as the reverse migration, so the great migration was driven by, you know, extreme discrimination and racism. What we're seeing now is a reversal of that. You know, where does racism fit into that? Has the story that, you know, we in the North like to tell about, you know, how racist the South still is, is that not true? Or are black Americans so desperate due to inflation and things like that, that they're willing to encounter racism? I mean, in order to pursue those opportunities. How do you see that? Well, honestly, Batia, what a lot of black people will tell you is that the North isn't exactly anti-racist <laughs> either. I mean, you'll hear them say it. I live in the North and I experience racism in the North. So, I mean, it, there, there could be a lot of different opinions on this in the black community. I mean, the South still has that reputation for racism because of the history. But what I, I glean from it is that Obviously, these people don't believe that racism is enough of an obstacle to keep black people from achieving their goals if they move to the South. So even if they still believe that it remains, they, they still don't believe that this can keep them from moving forward, building generational wealth and all the things that, that you hear us talk about and closing those disparities. And that speaks to a point I think probably gets made on this show a lot, which is that, you know, kind of lip service to anti-racism or, or, or even a real commitment to anti-racism, having a culture that is, you know, more friendly on paper to, uh, to minorities is one thing. But if the economic conditions are so miserable, I mean, that's the, especially for people from disadvantaged backgrounds, many of whom are minorities, then that ends up being a kind of, you know, de facto racism that can actually be even worse. It can be li literally unlivable compared to the other stuff, uh, you know, in, in terms of if cities have housing policies where they don't build new housing or, or, the, or the kind of, you know, the local um, uh, kind of in, entrenched, wealthier, often white community prevents, you know, new housing developments uh, and, and that then black people aren't able to live there or disadvantaged people aren't able to live there, like that can be just as racist, that if not more racist or, or more unlivable, more unworkable workable than just like, well, the people here, you know, had a history or oh, the older people here, their grandparents, you know, were, were unkind or looked down on black people. Uh, right. Is it is what I'm saying making any sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that does make sense, Robbie. I mean, it, and it's funny because a lot of people think that uh, policies that they define as systemically racist, they don't just happen in, in the South. The ones that they view as systemically racist also happen in the North and in the West as, as well. And so I think black people are basically, I mean, it, it, like you say, like people say, you vote with your wallet. I mean, we're voting with our feet. We see the opportunity in the South in red states and and that's where we're going to go. 
So, I mean, I, I think that that's really what we're, see, we're seeing here. I, I don't think that racism is as much of an issue. I mean, whether the North and South are racist or not, we can all agree that it's not as racist as it used to be back in the 70s, 60s, and 50s. So to me, while racism still remains a hot button topic, it's not, it, it's not to the point to where people view it as an insurmountable obstacle that keeps them from achieving their objectives. Yeah, I mean, one thing that people really don't pay attention to is, um, you know, the, for example, um, the New York City public schools are more segregated than Alabama's, you know, like the, the narrative that we like to tell that comforts us in the North, right, in blue cities is just totally false. And I wonder, Jeff, is this a referendum on the American dream and where you're more likely to achieve that? Where, Like Robbie says, where you're more likely to be able to afford a home, to get a good education for your children. Like, it, are Black Americans a sort of bellwether for the failure of the American dream in these very very um, segregated, both racially and from a class point of view, northern blue cities, as opposed to a kind of um, a middle class that still is thriving in, in red states. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Historically, I mean, there there have been a lot of issues. I mean, especially when it comes to achieving the, the American dream. America was not always living up to the values on which it, it, was, it was it was founded. But the great thing about America is that if you don't like where you are, you can move, mm. you can relocate. And people always talk about, oh, so many people aren't, they have, to, they have to remain in their poor cities. Well, that's not necessarily the case for everybody. For most people, they will pack up and move, even if it's scary, even if they don't really know what to expect. If they see a better opportunity, they will move to the part of the country that they believe is offering that opportunity. And that, that really, that's what we're seeing here. Mm. Well, Jeff Charles, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me back. And we'll be back with more Rising right after this.